Hello. I would like to thank first the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture about Tau, Tangels and Alzheimer. Tangels are a major neuropathological feature in tauopathies and Alzheimer, and in Alzheimer's it comes together with the amyloid and other major pathology. It seems that since tangles are in better correlation with the clinical dementia, better than the amyloid plaques, and since isolated amyloid pathology is actually not pathogenic, and that amyloid toxicity is tau dependent, and also since tangles can be amyloid independent regulated, like by genetic and environmental factors, therefore it seems the tau can be an important and preferential target in anti-Alzheimer therapy. For developing therapeutic approaches, what we need is to better understand the tau pathogenesis, to have useful and authentic animal models, and to have good markers for diagnosis and monitoring. Tau protein is expressed mostly in neurons and also in glia. Its function is in microtubuli binding, axonal transport, neuronal glial contacts, and others. It can be, it has a six isoform depending, uh, depending on the splicing both in the uh, microtubuli binding domain, three or four, and in the end terminal. And it goes through uh, many post-translation and modifications, phosphorylation, acetylation, methylation, urethylation, nitration, glycosylation, isomerization, etc. Some of them are toxic, like the phosphorylation, glycosylation, and the transcation, and isomerization, and regarding others, it's not known, like acetylation. And when it's a, a pathologically a modified, it causes both loss of function, loss of function of microtubuli binding, you can see here, and also gain of function because it aggregates and it's toxic already at the stage of tau oligomer. The tangle pathology can appear as a primary tauopathies among the older tauopathies, diseases which are related to tau, primary tauopathies in which we have tangles only, uh, mostly or in many cases due to mutations in tau, or the secondary uh, tauopathy like Alzheimer or Down syndrome in which it goes together with amyloid or even secondary to it, and there's no mutation of tau causing amyloid, causing Alzheimer. And the different diseases which share all pathology of tau are actually very different, very distinct. We can see it in terms of uh, the isoforms, like the post-translation modification, aggregation, here it shows in structural studies, and also the phenotype is different. So we have diseases which all share tau pathology, but there are different diseases which we have to take into account in thinking about the uh, treatment. The tau, the pathology propagates between cells, here one cell secretes truncated, phosphorylated uh, tau, usually the N-terminal, and then it goes uh, by endocytosis uh, to, to cells in the neighborhood or by a transsynaptic uh, spread. What regulates it is the amyloid plaques and microglia, which takes, uh, it participates by phagocytosis and then exome uh, secretion. So this is the way the pathology spreads. Tau pathology from the beginning to the end point starts with tau synthesis, the various isoforms, and then PTA modifications and misfolded, and then it can get, go into clearance or it becomes a misorted, aggregated, released to the extracellular space to spreading and a disassembly of a microtubuli, all together giving us the process of neurodegeneration. Regarding the relationship of tau with amyloid, there are a few aspects. The, one, the first one is the known one. Amyloid plaques are upstream to tangles, enable the tau pathology. And we know it from humans, people who have the mutation of amyloid. It starts from amyloid, presents plaques and tangles. And we see it in a way also in animal models, animal mutant models have plaques, but the early pathological forms of uh, tau in the form of phosphorylated, yet not uh, tangles. 
And also studies showing that when tau mutant is exposed to amyloid, there is increase in tau aggregation spreading. Another aspect of the relation between tau and amyloid is the tau pathology is amyloid independent. Tangles can develop directly without plaques, like in tau mutants, and also there is different responsiveness of plaques in tangles, like in neuroinflammation. It can reduce plaque but enhance tangles and also with responsiveness to nicotine. Another approach, another aspect actually, is the amyloid pathology being tau dependent. We know that knockout of tau enhances tau the amyloid toxicity. And also the study, like the study here of uh, Professor Michelson showing that phosphorylation of tau can mediate pathological interaction between APOE and amyloid. So there are some indications that also tau amyloid is uh, amyloid pathology is tau dependent. Tau can influence the amyloid. So after having some understanding of the tau pathology, we need good animal models. And the mutations were used to generate uh, animal models. And the way it was done was uh, either inserting genomic mouse or human gene of tau to, to mouse or human uh, cDNA, the various isoforms among the six. And there's overexpression of Y type, which was used mutants, one to three mutation or truncated, constitutive expression or inducible, exogenous or login. And the very important point is which promoter is used. Many of them use the Taiwan, the neuronal one, or prion a, a promoter or the GFAP for astrocytes only. And then what we use is the promoter, the authentic, the original one of tau, in order to get correct expression in terms of which cells do express the, the, the mutant tau and the level of expression, etc. Other models which were generated for tangles are tau kinases, a GSK or CDK the activator, or combination of tau with kinases or APP with NOS2. All of them generated uh, tangles in the mouse. Looking at our model, we generated double mutant uh, with the original tau promoter, which was actually isolated by the late Irit Ginsburg, and we used it for this model to get physiological regulation. We can see here that the level of expression using the pan tau phi is about 10% higher than the genus. We don't speak here about an and an overexpression model which has these uh, disadvantages. So what we saw expression phosphorylated tau tangles, both in neurons and in uh, glia, cognitive deficit, astrogliosis, uh, LTP deficit here by uh, Menachem Segal, and uh, all the pathology here by uh, uh, Nicholas Grigoriadis. No amyloid is detected, meaning we have an isolated model for tangles. And we wanted to see what, how does this tau, mutant tau, uh, reacts with the environmental risk factor, risk factors for Alzheimer, epidemiologically based. And we see that inflammation enhances the tangle, uh, surgical menopause enhances oxidative stress and the green enrichment and of uh, environmental enrichment. So we see tau without the mediation of amyloid speaks with various triggers and enhances the pathology. Actually, this can be used also of combined models to test genetic and environmental. And we saw that when exposing those mice to a mitochondrial toxin of oxidative stress, a targets increase, and it was uh, mediated via the GSK and microglia. And we know microglia are in good correlation with tangles, so we see here Tangles react to this uh, stimulus, uh, nothing to do with amyloid. Isolated tau can do it. And also in an enriched environment, the tau reacts by neurogenesis, uh, via BDNF. Tau can perform all this along without amyloid. And then we were thinking about another model which is not genetic. We wanted it to be pure environmental because most of the patients develop the disease not, not because genetic factor. And, uh, and what we wanted to do 
we expose them to high fat, high sugar, high salt, all of them risk factors for a dementia, and we performed ovariectomy to have aged women, which is in high risk. We got increased body weight, increased blood glucose and blood pressure, a cognitive impairment, and impaired mitochondrial activity here by also Ansada. And we saw in brain pathology very new results, not published yet, but the new results from Nicholas showing us that the increase in phosphotau and galleas tangles, and also in amyloid in GFAP in IBA, meaning exposing animals, normal animals, to all this risk factor. <coughs> Sorry. We can get a model having all those pathologies, and it can be used depending <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to the question that we ask. Another model in use is streptozoticin related to diabetes. We know diabetes is a risk factor for uh, Alzheimer, and we can see here that if you inject it, it's a pro-diabetic uh, toxin, it causes oxidative stress, neuronal damage. If it's injected either IP or ICV, it can cause tau phosphorylation, impaired insulin signaling, cognitive impairment, also increased amyloid beta in both mode of deliveries. And, and we can see that while in IP injection you get higher glucose in blood, it's not the case when you inject in ICV. So it's more affecting uh, only the brain, some kind of brain uh, diabetes. This is another model that it depends on the question that we ask because the etiology is specific and this may be relevant for developing drugs. Another new model that we recently generated with a group of uh, Professor Danny Frankel combining crossing the 5FAD of FASAR with our uh, model of TAU in order to see the relationship between uh, these uh, two pathologies under the regulation of the physiological uh, TAU promoter and we saw the physiological expression of mutant tau impairs astrocytes activity and exacerbate beta amyloid in the pathology uh, of uh, in 5FAD. And can, here can be shown, standing by Professor James Panke, showing increased amyloid. And this is interesting because usually we expect the combination of amyloid and tau to increase the tau pathology. So here also the amyloid pathology is increased, neuritic plaques are increased, and we believe it's related to the uh, abnormality in astrocytes shown here, dystrophic mutant tau astrocyte dystrophic. So the whole mechanism of interaction between those two models looking into the relationship in the astrocytic uh, failure and microglia will be presented tomorrow by Professor Danny Frankel. Another model is an autoimmune. If somebody wants to ask about immune disease or, or autoimmunity related at all, it's relevant because uh, we detected antibodies in the serum of uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease against phosphorylated tau. So we can use it as a model. We injected full length tau with the uh, adjuvant and pertussis and we got more inflammation, neurological deficit and tauopathy. So there's another model which can fit specific questions. So now that we have some models which can be relevant, what about biomarkers? We have relatively good biomarkers. We can use it in a CSF, and CSF can be tested total tau, phosphor tau, and other things. Here we tested the total tau and showed that in Alzheimer's it's higher than in other diseases, neurological diseases, which are not, not degenerative. And interestingly, Alzheimer's is higher than other tauopathies, which are non-Alzheimer's tauopathy, the, um, the primary tauopathies, again showing us that the same pathology can give different mechanisms, different diseases. The same is in imaging using the PET uh, tracer, which uh, correlates well with the BRAC stages for targets, shows also uh, tangles and again less useful for non alzheimer tauropathies. The third group is of plasma biomarkers recently used, and particularly for phosphorylated tau at 217 is a good biomarker. Here we see that Alzheimer symptomatic already is higher than normal in NCI and again higher than other tauropathy which are not uh, uh, without amyloid. And, uh, and it's very correlative with the PET. Positive PET goes with higher plasma biomarker. 
And in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, it can be shown that here at the preclinical stage, phosphotaurin plasma together with amylo and GFAP is diagnostic, and close to age at onset, the phosphotaurin plasma with cognitive tests is diagnostic, and later when it's active, to diagnose it, it's enough to use the phosphotaurin. The another general marker, the NFT, which can be used for general degeneration, but if we speak specific of tau, those are the biomarkers which can be used for diagnosis and also monitoring, and we'll see it in the immunotherapy with amyloid. Looking here at the time course, we can see that amyloid plaques get to the plateau at a very early stage, at a preclinical stage, while the NFT pathology goes up gradually till it gets at a very late stage to the uh, plateau, meaning that this time window may be relevant for interference. It's still going up, while amyloid plaques gets very early to be um, at a plateau. So if we believe that tau is a good target for uh, tauopathy and Alzheimer, actually it's not so trivial to target tau. And why? First of all, as we said, different tau and different tangles in different tauopathies. We have to be very specific in this targeting. Uh, how do we select which component to attack, the loss or the gain, gain of function of tau? And if we want to direct, uh, target the tau directly like antibodies, which tau isoform? Which isoform among the six of them? Which tau post-transnational modified should we? attack the phosphotau or the truncated, and again in a direct targeting which region, the N-terminal, that's relevant for the extracellular tau, or the C-terminal or microtubuli binding domain, which are more relevant to aggregation. And if we want to uh, target it indirectly, it will be more non-specific with side effects. If we want to target the glia, which is very relevant for tangles, we know the complexity of microglia, the double-edged sword effect. And if we want to target enzymes of the post-translation, and which of them, we know it's a very complex regulation with a subsequent order, with a competitive inverse relations between the different PTMN. If we want to target the folding, the misfolding, white like chaperon or epi chaperons, if we use, for instance, the HSP19 inhibitor, with all its side effects. And if we believe that amyloid is upstream to tau, maybe we will target the amyloid, hoping that it will affect the tau. So this is some uh, uh, thoughts and some things showing that it's not so trivial. So maybe, we'll go over these slides, so maybe it will be preferential to do multi-targeting. You know, the term of multi-targeting is very used in this uh, context. What I mean, let's multi-target the tau itself, combined loss and gain of function, microtubule stabilization with anti-aggregation, etc., in other combinations. And if we speak about Alzheimer itself, multi-targeting in the terms of tau and amyloid, but to do it personalized, if somebody has more tau or more amyloid, it should be uh, targeted uh, correlatively, and the timing and to see more vasculars, to see in a personal way which targets to combine. So if we look at the pathology and what we can uh, fight against, which targets, we can in the level of tau synthesis, siRNA, miRNA, and antisys oligonucleotides. In the PTM, we have various inhibitors, which is not so simple because acetyl as inhibitor doesn't, it's still not clear if it helps or if it should be prevented. And if we speak about clearance to enhance proteosome and autophagy and microtubule stabilizer and to inhibit aggregation, either by aggregation inhibitor or by antibodies, or inhibit the spreading by antibodies. Since most of the studies as for today uh, speak about uh, immunotherapy, I would like to say a few words about immunotherapy, the way to this concept. And the first publication in this issue was the, the publication we published regarding immunization animals with a full length tau. We immunize with adjuvant and pertussis, and we saw that this is toxic. We shouldn't use the whole molecule. We should use very targeted against the toxic part of the molecule. Therefore, we use peptides or phosphorylated tau, specific toxic phosphorylation. And what we got, reduced tangles, improved cognition, 
and mechanistically what we saw that it's antibody related and the serum is immunoreactive as the pathology antibodies were detected near the parenchyma and autophagy was taking place. And we also saw that if we do it repeatedly, the immunization to under a pro-inflammatory milieu, we might get some signs of neuroinflammation, increasing a neurological score, may be relevant to patients which have some pro-inflammatory condition, immunization should be uh, taken with caution. And the mechanism of immunotherapy, which we believe antibodies bind to receptors on the membrane, either FC or Taiwan or LRP, or maybe to the tau itself, which is part of it sits also in the membrane, and then it goes into the cell, disintegration and mesosomal de degradation, and then the extracellular tau, which antibodies can bind to it and cause disassembly and cleared by microglia. So this may be the mechanism. We next thought about the possibility to use this phosphorylated tau not in tangled mice, but in amyloid mice, with the thought that amyloid transgenic mice have the early pathological form of tau pathology in the form of phosphorylated tau. So if tau is so relevant, if we target this fraction, maybe we'll get an improvement. And what we saw is that when ejected into transgenic mice, we got improvement in, in cognition. And as expected, tau was reduced here. And we saw also that amyloid was reduced. And this was very interesting. You target tau, and you get also amyloid response. Again, gives us some clue regarding the, the interplay with them. And we see that it's maybe related to activation of microglia. And here we see the binding of the 88 of the anti-tau, both extracellular and intercellular in Omarski. And here we see that the microglia can surround both the amyloid and the tangles and the tau. So there is a possibility to use phosphato and which affect also the amyloid. And this causes the, the, this slide showing the interplay between amyloid and tau. If you immunize against one pathology, how does it affect the other? And here we can see in preclinical studies, immunizing animals with amyloid causes many beneficial effects, but it shows also decrease in tau, in phosphotau and total tau. We do it with um, in tau, we immunize mice with tau, and we see what we showed in others as well, that amyloid is reduced. What going on in the clinical stage? In the clinical studies, it has been shown that some of the antibodies show decrease in amyloid, in, in phosphotal. You target the, the amyloid and you get a decrease. It, it's been shown in PET and CSF, particularly in the Dukanumab, and uh, which is interesting. You target amyloid, you get also to the, to the tau. And when you immunize the tau, the antibodies presented here, Still not clear, no evidence that this is the situation also of clinical trials that you affect tau and you get also to amyloid. As for today, there are five general approaches to anti tau therapies in clinical studies. One is the genetically targeting in antisensory gonoglotides, and then small molecules of enzyme inhibitors, aggregation inhibitor, clearance enhancer, and in immunotherapies. And among the immunotherapies, mostly it's passive, but also active, and then mostly targeting the N-terminal in purpose of the extracellular tau, some of them, one of them phosphorylated, and some of them um, abnormal uh, structure. So this is uh, the situation regarding immunotherapy. If we look at the outcome of clinical trial as for today, we can see all the categories, tau aggregation, gene therapy, immunotherapy, kinase inhibitor, glucosylase inhibitor, and microtubuli stabilizer. Looking at the outcome, which is not so encouraging, let's see, we can see insignificant. We can see uh, did not show cognitive decline, failed, stopped, uh, no significant, failed, uh, not significant. Many of them are not so encouraging, and we look at the immunotherapy, we can see the vaccine did not slow cognitive decline and failed and stopped. 
So this is the situation as for today. Let's go back to this slide speaking about not trivial to target tau. So if we do it in a multi-targeting of combining loss and gain, because so far the clinical trial did either loss or either gain. Maybe should, should, uh, we should combine microtubule stabilizer with an antibody and things like this. And maybe there's another way to think a more broad way of targeting, which targets also the etiology. We speak about aging as a process relevant to tau and Alzheimer. Diabetic, maybe this would be uh, targeted. And also maybe if we do it in a broad way of cell therapy, neuronal or either glial or cell component therapy. And what has been shown, that, uh, first of all, okay, we'll see this first, that if we want to target the etiology, there are now studies, clinical study, studies of repurposing existing drugs, trying to use them for tauropathy and Alzheimer. We speak about anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, anti-epileptic, antimicrobial, antioxidant, antipsychotic, iron chelator, and non-steroidal. So this is another way to find drugs. At least it's less expensive than the development of new drugs and maybe more quickly. So this is also under study. And if we speak about cell therapy and cell component therapy, which is a broad FA approach, we can see that injection of neuronal stem cells to amyloid model caused decrease in amyloid, decrease in phosphorylated tau, tau and improved cognition. Maybe we can think about cell therapy also, glial cells with all uh, the disadvantages, but something that we have still to think about it. And if we speak about cell component, what we did, we do here organelle therapy, we use mitochondrial and transfer it to, to mice. We first did it in, in other models, in if amyloid and others, and we saw improvement. And here we tried it also in tangle model. What we do, we take fresh active isolated mitochondria from cells. This is a collaboration with the lab of Chayagalski, providing the mitochondria. And we injected IV to animal models and we can see improved cognitive performance, increased neuronal count, and improved mitochondrial activity. And we know from other models that the mechanism is not that the mitochondria reach the brain, cross the BBB, it's rather via the liver. It activates the liver to secrete some uh, factors which by an uh, endocrine um, axis between the liver and the brain does the effect. So this is a feasible uh, method, a feasible approach, because mitochondria can be isolated from a uh, autologous source or other sources and can be injected. So this is something that we work on it. Another uh, cell component therapy, we use secretions of cell, uh, cells. We use secretion of mesenchymal stem cells, stem cells uh, from the lab of uh, Professor Karosis. We uh, grow them on artificial CSF, and we collect the secretions, and we insert it to uh, one ventricle, and in the other ventricle, we collect the endogenous CSF. Therefore, we call it CSF exchange therapy. And in order to calibrate and learn the whole uh, method, we started with, a, with acute models of the CNS, believing that actually this method can be relevant to many diseases of the CNSF because it's a more general holistic approach, particularly to already affected patients. We don't believe it's, it's relevant to as preventive. We speak about it in terms of like dialysis, brain dialysis. And when we use it in EAE model, we saw a decrease in, in the score relative to non-treated. And we saw also a decreased axonal damage and demyelination. Here in between, we see other things. If we don't eliminate the endogenous, we also see some effects. But the best is we use, uh, we eliminate the endogenous and we enrich the CSF with an uh, enrichment of mesenchymal stem cells. We did that also in amyloid model of ICV injected, which developed after a few days. Uh, uh, brain disease, and we saw improved cognitive performance, increased neuronal count and neurogenesis and astrogliosis. So this may be used also for other models. For transgenic, it's a long-term therapy, and we, it's 
keeping it fixed, all the kernel is a little uh, problematic, so we show that the proof of concept in, in acute diseases, but it may be relevant and it's actually feasible to do it also in humans. And lastly, I would like to say, how is it as for today, looking at the ALS form, among over 300 clinical trials, less than 10%, here 25, focuses on tau, which I believe it's relatively low and more emphasis should be made. And if we take out all those which are inactive and discontinued, we can see this is what left nine immunotherapy, small molecules five to six, and one only gene therapy. To summarize, as correlative with dementia, tau is a preferential target. Different tang tangles and tau are in different uh, tauopathies and Alzheimer's, which need specific approaches. We have quite useful and authentic animal models, genetic, autoimmune, environmental, and crossed with amyloid beta and uh, poor diabetic, western dial aging. And we have a new model of 5 f tau with physiological expression of infantile impaired astrocytic activity and exacerbated beta amyloid pathology with uh, Professor Danny Frankel to be shown tomorrow. And we have relatively good biomarkers in the CSF, PET, and plasma. And currently at clinical uh, trials are the antisense oligonucleotide, small molecules, and immunotherapy. Repurpose in drug is also under study. And due to the complexity of tau pathogenesis, maybe a more upstream method or combination or broad approaches may be beneficial. Upstream, we speak about antisense oligonucleotides, combinations, and broad therapy of anti aging, anti diabetic, and cell related therapy, cell component. And I would like to thank all the people who helped with this, all the studies I presented for my lab, Sachar and Nir and uh, Moran and Karen and Sandrine and others, and other collaborators, Professor Grobiadis from Saloniki with the, all the pathology, and Chaya with the mitochondria and Anseada and Menachem Segal later it, with the promoter and the transgens, and Danny Frankel, Professor Jens Frankel for the new model of 5 FAD tau, the pathology, and Danny Frankel. Okay, thank you very much.